Good morning and good evening. Welcome to U.S. Impact's 12th analyst call with top experts and our third post-election call. My name is John and moderating our call this week from the center of the discussion in India, in India Mr. Ravinder Sachdev. We hope our attendees understand that we have to mute everyone upon entry as it would be very hard to hear our panelists otherwise. Everyone should have received instructions as to how to submit questions and we again thank those who have already contributed. Those joining via WebEx will see a Q&A tab on the right to submit questions to the hosts and our expert panel. Now to start this special expert series, uh, expert series conference call, I'd like to first introduce the chairman of U.S. Impact, Mr. Sanjay Puri. Sanjay? Thank you, John. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here for our weekly call with experts. Our uh, theme today is the 100-day agenda of the Modi government, which is a very ambitious agenda that the new prime minister has laid out. And he's basically chartered his key ministers to come up with uh, key action items and plans, laying out an aggressive agenda to do reforms and other things that relate to that. And our experts are going to talk to, uh, to you about that. Our team has put together expert speakers each week. U.S. Impact uh, volunteers have worked hard uh, covering the election, covering the cabinet, and now the agenda moving forward. So it's my pleasure to bring on board our um, India Head of Operations, Ravinder Sachdev, who's going to be moderating our uh, discussion. Ravinder. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Uh, may I invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Surbhi Garg, for the introduction of our first speaker. Surbhi, could you please? Sure, Ravinder, thank you. Welcome, Dr. Gokran, uh, a brief intro on him. Dr. Subir Gokran is the Director of Research of the Brookings Institution, India Center. Prior to this, Dr. Gokran was Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India. He has also been the Executive Director and Chief Economist of CRISIL and Chief Economist at the National Council of Applied Economic Research. And he was also Associate Professor at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research in Mumbai. And he contributes to fortnightly column on current economic issues to the business standards, a leading financial baby in India. He's currently serving a two-year term as member of the National Security Advisory Board. Without taking much time, uh, Robinder, I hand it over to you for moderating our session. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Survey. And once again, welcome to our callers and our callers who are logging into this call. Please do keep your questions coming in, as John has already mentioned, because your questions really help us guide the conversation with our eminent experts. Uh, uh, Dr. Gokun, without taking much further time, may I invite you to kind of lay out some of your opening thoughts on the topic of the day, which is some of the highlights and challenges for the 100-day agenda or the discussions thereabouts of the new government in India. Dr. Gokun, please. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to, to talk to this group. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I, what I want to do is I was, in, I was asked to confine my opening comments to about five minutes, which I'll try and do. Uh, mm -hmm. And I will focus on the economic uh, policy challenges that the new government faces. Uh, I want mm -hmm. to highlight four specific issues which uh, the government has to deal with, uh, at least to seem to be dealing with in the 100-day period. Uh, and the first of these is the fiscal issue, which will actually manifest uh, in the budget, which is uh, going to be presented uh, in the first half of July. That is really going to be the mm -hmm. first uh, significant opportunity for the government to articulate uh, both a fiscal stance uh, in the current situation and a fiscal strategy uh, with the five-year horizon that the government has. Uh, so on that issue, I think there are three or four points that I want to emphasize. Uh, one is clearly that we have to be looking at significant tax reform uh, in order to bridge what has now become a very uh, sort of uh, onerous uh, and uh, permanent fiscal deficit uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the big instrument there, the big uh, uh, change uh, there is uh, the GST, the goods and services tax. This is something that the government has been talking about for a long time. It requires a constitutional amendment, which is a process in India similar to what the U.S. goes through for constitutional amendment. Uh, so it is a pretty laborious process, but I think the debate has reached a point where uh, there is really no choice but to bring in this very, very strong self-enforcing tax regime, 
uh, which is mm -hmm. going to make a huge difference in terms of the government's ability to to raise revenues without really distorting uh, economic activity. I think that, that's a fundamental requirement. So, so GS reform may not happen in this budget, but at least a roadmap and a commitment uh, has got to be announced, and I hope that that will be done. The second issue, which I think is very important, is the uh, commitment of larger resources to capital expenditure. Uh, uh, infrastructure is uh, clearly India's uh, most significant problem today, and I will come to that point specifically in a minute. But from the fiscal mm -hmm. front, uh, after many years of trying to attract private capital into infrastructure, I think we've got to come to grips with the reality that this is not going to provide a solution. Uh, public money is uh, catalytic. It is critical to getting infrastructure onto a different trajectory and the budget has to find more resources to commit to infrastructure. How that's to be done, I think, is a matter of detail and strategy, but uh, as, an, as an objective, I think it is, is very fundamental. The third is mm -hmm. related to this, how do you get more money to, to spend on capital? And I think the obvious answer to that is to try and uh, sell the assets that you already have and commit those to capital spending. So we've been in a number of scandal scenarios with uh, coal and spectrum and so on, but the bottom line is that mm -hmm. these are assets the government has been trying to sell, and I think they can do a, uh, a reasonably transparent and uh, sort of uh, effective, efficient job of selling them, including holdings in public enterprises, and channelize that money into uh, into infrastructure. So call this a sort of balance sheet swap uh, where you sell one set of assets which are really not serving any uh, significant public purpose and uh, uh, and allocate those resources to assets which will actually serve a public purpose. I think that's, that's an important transition to make. And the fourth element is the subsidy bill. We have a huge subsidy bill approaching at the federal government level, close to 3% of GDP, and we need to bring that down, put a cap on it, and decide within that cap what the most effective targeting of subsidies is going to be. I think that's something that uh, that is an absolute imperative for the government today. So that's on the fiscal front, and I do expect to see at least the strategy for this, uh, if not actual measures, being laid out by uh, by the uh, budget statement uh, this year, and of course uh, following this, the budget that is to come in February of 2015. Uh, I mm -hmm. want to emphasize three uh, structural issues uh, which have to find a very uh, high priority on the, uh, in the 100-day agenda. Uh, the first is mm -hmm. food inflation. We've, we've been uh, plagued with food inflation for the last uh, seven years. Uh, it has been over or close to 10% over that period, and this is really putting an enormous constraint on uh, the central bank in terms of uh, being able to stimulate growth through interest rate actions. Uh, as long as food inflation mm -hmm. remains high, inflation expectations are high, and you know the bank is compelled then to keep rates high. And this has led to a lot of complaints from the business community, but that's the way it goes. Uh, but the way to bring food inflation down is to have farmers produce more of what consumers want. This is not happening because of a whole series of government interventions, and the, the mm -hmm. most important task for the new government is to streamline those interventions, to take the ones that are distorting output, and uh, let the consumer and the farmer actually become more, you know, sensitive to each other's uh, actions. Uh, big, uh -huh. big change because this is a, this is a very, very entrenched uh, incentive system, and it's going to take a lot of doing. But I think that's a very important part. There are a whole bunch of other uh, related issues, but this is the key one. On the infrastructure mm -hmm. front, uh, we have been experimenting with uh, a public-private partnership framework uh, to try and get private capital into infrastructure for the last 10 years. Uh, there have been some successes. Uh, ob obviously, this has not been a complete disaster. But on the whole, this has resulted in, uh, I think, a number of, uh, sort of unfulfilled expectations. Uh, on the mm -hmm. private side, uh, projects are, uh, too, too few companies executing too many projects. Uh, stretching themselves thin, not able to manage the environment effectively, and resulting in lots of delays, financial stress, which is spilling over to the banking system, which is also creating some complications. On the public side, mm -hmm. the problem with approvals and clearances, uh, the projects are getting delayed beyond any uh, sort of reasonable uh, cost calculations, and that is then feeding back into financial uh, non-viability. So both sides have to get their act together. As I said in my earlier segment, uh, you know, I can't see a way around government, more government money, and uh, that being act, that actually acting as a sort of venture or seed capital uh, input, uh, I think it's very important to do that. Uh, identify critical projects, put more government money in, get them working, and then sort of use that as a reassuring, uh, you know, signal to private investors to bring uh, money in. So I think that's the way to go on infrastructure. 
Uh, and the last one is mm -hmm. unemployment. This is a huge, huge, huge challenge. Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in the workforce. We have uh, close to 10 million entering the workforce every year. We're going to have this pressure mm -hmm. uh, building up over the next two decades, and our job creation record has been extremely inadequate. Uh, if we don't find jobs for these people, uh, we are, I think, uh, headed uh, uh, for a very significant socio-political uh, stress situation, even a crisis. Uh, the government, the new government, in its campaign has been extremely uh, emphatic on the need to create jobs, and I think it's a very positive sign. But this needs to translate mm -hmm. into very clear strategies, which I hope will be announced in the 100-day agenda. So that's a broad sweep of critical issues. There's a fiscal uh, adjustment. There is uh, food inflation, managing the agricultural sector. Uh, getting farmers to grow what people want, uh, what consumers want to eat. Uh, there is the infrastructure mm -hmm. issue, which is how do we get a lot of stock projects moving again? How do we improve the financial viability so that we can start to attract private capital into them? And that means starting off with more government money. And uh, the fourth is the employment situation, uh, very bad record so far. Uh, need some very some fresh thinking, a whole bunch of things that need to be put together to do this skills, jobs, uh, safety nets, you know, it's a very, very complex mm -hmm. challenge. The most important challenge, no question, but I think the one that will take the most time to, to arrive at a strategy. Uh, but I hope, again, some beginning is made in the 100 days. So that was my broad, uh, you know, uh, set of opening comments, and I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, of course, you know, you broadly laid out the canvas in a very wide manner, and in fact, Several of the questions which have come to us during the week, uh, as every week we announce this conference or, or, or this call discussion, are I think you've already touched on them, but probably we'll be going deeper into them. At this point, probably I'll pick up one or two specific questions. One of the questions was asking okay. that, and you mentioned food inflation. In the first 100 days, sure, that should be a priority, but what is the possibility you see of this food inflation coming down within 100 or or? days. What is your feel oh, about absolutely, that? Oh, uh, absolutely no possibility of it coming down in 100 days. But I think uh -huh. what's important is that if uh, uh, the strategy is correctly de designed and communicated, uh, it mm -hmm. immediately impacts on expectations. It immediately starts to signal to farmers mm -hmm. and to traders that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you cannot be riding this wave of continuous price increases. So you have to change your, your decisions vis-a-vis -vis cultivation, vis-a-vis -vis stocking. Uh, and there I think the, uh, the, the, the snowball effect of this uh, can be very powerful over the course of a year. I, I, I would not mm -hmm. expect uh, any of these initiatives to have an impact immediately, but I think it's necessary and absolutely critical to send the right signal uh, by designing the policy right. There is one opportunity to bring food inflation down relatively quickly, and that is to start uh, open market sales of uh, rice stocks. Rice has been a stress point over the last 18 months, and it is somewhat surprising that the previous government uh, did not venture into selling down uh, what are very substantial stocks uh, of rice that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this government has to do that very quickly. Uh, and if they do that, then that will be a signal, hey, look, that, you know, we're, we're getting to grips with the situation. It's very important to send that signal. And o over a few months, roll out the reforms and the incentive uh, framework that they need to do. Now, this is going to be politically very challenging because there are lots of True. vested interests in the existing framework. But this is a government for the first time that has a phenomenal mandate in terms of the number of uh, uh, parliament members of parliament tries. It cannot waste that opportunity to, to tread on a few toes uh, politically, which previous governments could not do for uh, because it risk, they risk their survival. Very true, sir. Very true. Thank you. And of course, I think uh, on the food inflation, the monsoon is also perhaps going to be a little bit uh, lower than the average, so to say. And we have yeah. we would have the upcoming elections also, so there might be a political compulsion also for this government to kind of take some steps on that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would come to the question. Monsoon is still, Sorry, uh, still uh, an unknown entity. Uh, we, we, you know, there uh -huh. are uh, concerns that it might be inadequate, but it's, uh, it's, it, it's still the middle of July that we actually we can uh, we have to wait till then to decide whether it's, it's, uh, you know, a failure or whether it's reasonable. So we still have some time, and it's difficult to predict how it's going to go. Uh, early signs are not so good. The, mon the, the start of the monsoon is already five days late. It just started to rain in Kerala yesterday. But early mm -hmm. starts or late starts have no bearing on the course of the monsoon. It's an extremely difficult uh, phenomenon to predict. Thank you, sir. Um, I was actually going on to a question relating to the GST, but in the meanwhile, I think we have a question coming on chat. And this question is asking us, 
the BJP is against FDI in retail. Now, statistics mm. show that this would improve efficiency and bring down food inflation. What do you think, sir? Well, I think uh, we have to look at it uh, uh, in, a, in a sort of series of uh, link in, through a series of linkages. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we shouldn't start with the FDI and retail issue. We just start with what we need to do to bring food inflation down. And as I said, one mm -hmm. one component of the strategy which is very critical is, as I said, reorienting the in incentive system to try and get farmers to produce more of what consumers want and not what the government wants them to produce. But the, the supporting ecosystem for that is more investment in a whole bunch of infrastructure and an improvement in the efficiency of the supply chain. Now, in order to do mm -hmm. that, clearly investment has to come in and organized retail is one very significant way in which uh, investment in supply chains happens. And this is, I think, the, 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 the largely speaking, the uh, global experience with, uh, with organized retail, that there are investments made uh, from, you know, in, in the entire supply chain from farm gate to, to consumer. And in order to achieve that, uh, we have to look at then what resources are available and to the extent that uh, resources from outside the country help to uh, to raise the level of investment in this uh, particular supply chain uh, framework, uh, then I think it's something that needs to be considered very favorably. So the party has, and, and the government uh, has taken a rather firm view on this. There are obviously, you know, strong political considerations on this. But I think if the issue issue is pitched as, as, as mm -hmm. I've pitched it, which is that, you know, let's work backwards from the fundamental objective of getting food inflation down, I think the political, uh, challenge may be easier to manage, and I hope that the messaging starts to take that tone rather than treat it as a simple, you know, FDI versus domestic investment conflict, which doesn't then link back to the whole, the larger issue of managing the supply chain. Very true, sir. Thank you so much. Um, again, before going back to the GST, I have another question which has come in, and this pertains to the land acquisition and the uh, RNR resettlement and rehabilitation bill. The question is asking, the previous UPA government has uh, passed this bill. Now, apparently, uh, the bill, the compensations which are being kind of talked about in the bill are not very convenient for the industry, so to say. Now, right. what do you see? Right. Do you see that any chance of, uh, you know, the rules and regulations being, or the bill being amended, or the rules and uh, regulations which come out are kind of more uh, con convenient or conducive, and will the government be able to do it? And if they are not able to do it, then what happens to the projects which are all held up? or? A big number of uh, Yeah, very, very important question, a very tricky question also, because uh, let's not forget that when the bill was passed, it was uh, supported mm -hmm. by the BJP in Parliament. So in a sense, the BJP also has a stake in the, uh, in the compensation framework that the bill has put in place. Uh, now, mm -hmm. this of course raises a number of questions. Was that, you know, what was the political motivation to agree to that bill then, and has that changed now? Uh, and that that is an uncertain and unpredictable process. Uh, I think it's quite well understood, by and large, including you know statements by some bureaucrats recently, that at the end of the day, this is an extremely difficult set of conditions to fulfil. The costs of land will go up very sharply if all of these are to be followed to the letter, and uh, this will make many many projects unviable. So that is, I think, now broadly understood. The question is, how do we scale back from this? Uh, the two sets mm -hmm. of issues. One is that the government already owns a fairly large amount of land, and you know that's something that has to be activated, put into use much more effectively than it has been so far. The land banks the government has, I'm told, in some states. But whatever land mm -hmm. the government has can be put that to use without getting into the compensation and rehabilitation issue to begin with. That's so. That's I think a top priority to try and get make the most of what the government already owns. Uh, second is when you're talking about acquisition, uh, mm -hmm. states are obviously also uh, feeling a bit uh, constrained by this, uh, the, the terms and conditions of the central legislation, the federal legislation. And uh, whatever True. flexibility there is within the constitutional arrangement between center and states uh, for states to exercise some discretion, uh, people have suggested, I think it's an important suggestion, that uh, they should, the states' uh, laws, if they're, if they're not amending but actually imposing somewhat less uh, restrictive conditions, that the center can, uh, can uh, specify 
or make explicit that the state law overrides the central law. So that will then allow states that want to push ahead with uh, uh, with uh, sort of attracting large projects uh, to do this. Now these are all a little fuzzy. I mean, you know, I'm not speaking with uh, with any uh, constitutional expertise here. This is what I'm picking up mm -hmm. in my conversations with the various people. Uh, but I have there's no question in my mind that these are right now a number of alternative uh, attempts to try and get around that very, very uh, sort of, uh, I call it oppressive, call it burdensome, uh, call it expensive, uh, but it is clearly something that uh, is uh, is keeping the business uh, community and obviously also uh, the, the development strategy uh, awake at night because uh, real estate costs, I mean, we're talking about real estate in the rural and sort of, you know, outside the urban areas here. But even in urban areas, if you're looking at real estate costs and their impact on business uh, uh, competitiveness, uh, they're very, very high. And one, one reason why uh, organized retail has generally not uh, succeeded in India to the extent that one might have expected is because real mm -hmm. estate costs, uh, completely wipe away the very thin margins that these businesses operate under. And so, you know, it's, it's a very tricky kind of, uh, the cost of land overall in the country is a huge, huge uh, constraint to to growth. And I think that's something that has to be addressed uh, from this larger perspective. Very true. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much. Uh, another question which we have coming up, actually since we are talking about legislations and this is on the foreign policy side maybe, and we'll be kind of going, kind of across, going to, you know, realms. Uh, on uh, domestic and international issues. The question is asking uh, regarding the nuclear civil liability bill. Uh, is there in, any chance or scope that the civil liability bill uh, could be amended as the uh, UN, have let's to... say, organizations have been asking for or looking at? Right. Uh, I think we should not uh, see this as a purely bilateral issue. Uh, clearly, uh, mm -hmm. the U.S. and perhaps a few other countries have a direct interest in it because of their ability to uh, or the, the, the opportunity they see in terms of India's nuclear uh, development. But I think you have to look at it from the perspective of India's overall energy security. And uh, mm -hmm. the whole motivation when we go back to 2008-9 when, uh, when the nuclear uh, agreement uh, was being negotiated and being, being thought through in the country was that we must mm -hmm. diversify our energy basket. Uh, you know, we, we are extremely mm -hmm. dependent on uh, imported uh, oil, and uh, when mm -hmm. we look at uh, you know climate change issues uh, and sustainability issues, uh, our only uh, sure domestic uh, source is coal. Uh, of course, for the mm -hmm. for the moment, not so because of these this this the scandal. But you know, in a, on a long term from long term perspective, coal is what we have in our uh, within our control. So from both sides, either from the vulnerability on imports or from the concerns about uh, uh, environmental consequences. Uh, we have to be looking at diversification, and so nuclear becomes a, a, a clear option. Which, you know, it, except for the for the the initial the startup, uh, you know, uh -huh. the, the fuel is, is is not that is not the same league of import dependence as as uh, on oil, and it's environmentally given. If you have all the safeguards and all the uh, the risk mitigators in place, it's, it, the impact on climate change is obviously uh, minimal. So it was a broad strategy for uh, fuel mix uh, diversification that drove this initiative. And, you know, mm -hmm. if at the end of this process we say, well, you know, that was the motivation and then we come up against a barrier on liability, uh, we're sort of kind of defeating the purpose, I think. So I think we've got to look at it again from the point of what is in India's interest. Uh, why did we get mm -hmm. into, this, uh, into this situation in the first place? And if we think mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do, then we have to ensure that it, we follow it through to its logical conclusion, which means you know the ability to invest in nuclear plants. Now there are civil society issues, you know, grassroots protests against nuclear. That's something that has to be managed within the domestic uh, political framework. But uh, to allow something like this to stop the to, to sort of uh, derail the strategy, I think we need to think about it a little more. But I think we should not be looking at it from the perspective of, you know, are we doing this in order to satisfy a specific bilateral objective, a specific bilateral interest? That may happen. That may be a positive fallout of this. But I think we have to do it from the viewpoint of are we achieving 
are are we we uh, working towards achieving this uh, greater diversification of our uh, fuel mix which which reduces our vulnerability on the import side and on the environmental side i think if we look at it from that perspective uh, the picture becomes mm -hmm. somewhat clearer sure thank you so much dr gokarn um now i think we'll move over to some topics we have actually quite a few questions backing up regarding economics and particularly your talks on gst and disposal yeah. or, or let's say disinvestment or divestments in psus but before we get back on those questions with you sir we also have our second expert speaker with us joining us captain abhimanyu i believe uh, surbi would you please introduce uh, captain abhimanyu sure ravindra it's a pleasure to introduce captain abhimanyu kendu due to captain sindhu's vast experience of handling organizational activities and deep understanding of grassroots issues captain sindhu served as a phone charge of uttar pradesh gtp recently he served in the indian army for about 6 years and then served as a civil service officer he is a founder and editor in chief of hari bhumi a hindi morning daily newspaper which has taken great leaps in haryana chhattisgarh madhya pradesh and parts of delhi and punjab Since we have very little time left, Mr. Uh, Abhijit, I'll hand it over to you to carry on with our uh, question and answer session and the session with uh, Captain Abhimanyu. Thank you so much, Surbi. Uh, welcome, Captain Abhimanyu, and once again to our callers. Please do keep in, uh, keep sending in your questions to us via chat. uh we are circling between questions on economics and politics and international affairs uh, captain abhimanyu once again welcome to our conference call discussion would you care to please give a few minutes of your overall views on the next 100 days of the modi government in india what are some highlights and what do you think could be some challenges in this period sir uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk to your conference call to all the audience that you have and Uh, first 100 days i believe that our focus must be to give a broad direction to the kind of governance that bjp has promised the people of india and their priorities are that we have to come out with a budget which is pro people which is, seems to be fulfilling the promises that we have made to the people and striking at the roots of uh, the inflation which is a top priority for us the second thing is to check on the put checks on the corruption and which we've already started uh, working on those things that how we can bring in transparency and accountability into the whole system so this this is the second priority which uh, our government should be looking at at the same time the very very important steps that this mr modi has taken for, for, uh, at the very first instance in his swearing in ceremony itself is mm -hmm. the building upon the relationships at the international level uh, particularly with our neighbors that the sark nation heads they joined in at the swearing in ceremony is a very very bold move very good move so i think the government has started off very well on uh, on very very broad issues related to international relations economy and uh, I, I, this another thing that uh, we need to focus upon is the agriculture sector which is a top priority for uh, and the, the bjp government we believe that it is the agriculture sector the vibrance in the agriculture sector and once it does well the indian economy does well so we have to ensure that the growth rate at which indian agriculture sector has been going in last 10 years had not been that good so we have to bring the focus back on the agriculture growth uh mm -hmm. besides that how employment generation can be uh, recovered from what it was in during uh, the india regime and it came down very very low in the upa uh, tenure almost 20 lakh uh, em employment generation annually whereas we were targeting something like 1 crore employment generation annually so this is something which we have to cover up a lot on this front so for that the business and industry has to do well and i'm sure the, these are the, uh, the the one important step that uh, prime minister narendra modi has taken is to remove the policy roadblocks and to take out the government from the slumber on, on from the policy paralysis to a proactive policy initiatives which have already taken off in clearing so many projects in the first few cabinet meetings so i think there is lot that we can expect in first 100 days but broadly i can say that it is what what is more important is the broad direction of the 
the, in, in which the government is going to take India in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Thank, th thank you so much. Um, uh, we have a question coming yeah. in. In fact, it has come in to us earlier. Uh, within the first 100 days, mm -hmm. apparently there is talk that in the next 10, 15 days, there would be a cabinet expansion or maybe a reallocation and some expansion. So the question is asking us uh, as to what would be your thoughts about what could be some new portfolios which some new ministers could take up uh, apparently on the 20th or 25th or before the budget session. Would you care to have any thoughts on that, sir, please? Uh, I'm sorry, I would not be able to speculate on the uh, progress uh -huh. of the Prime Minister. It's purely a discretion uh, of the Prime Minister that who should he include into the Cabinet and also the allocation of portfolios. And the good thing that I can mention about here is that the restructuring of the departments and the portfolios of the Cabinet which has been done is a very, very bold move again. Yes, as far as one, uh, the Defence Ministry is something which I think we've already said that we will have a full-fledged Defence Minister soon. Currently, Mr. Arun Jetli is holding charge uh, of the Defence Ministry. And unfortunately, we've lost our uh, Senior Union Minister uh, of Rural Development, Mr. Gopinath Munde. So uh, there could be someone coming in to take over that responsibility of that ministry also. But I won't get into the realm of speculation on these things. Sure, sir. Sure. Very much appreciated. And you can understand, you know, people are curious and wanting to know, and there is so much going on. Everybody is really wanting to know what's happening in India now. Okay. Uh, another question which has come up, which uh, we discussed with uh, Dr. Gokun, who's also with us, the former Deputy Governor of RBI. Uh, but this question is more in terms of legislation pertaining to the land acquisition and R&R uh, bill. The question was asking mm -hmm. that several uh, large projects in India are held up or getting delayed because of uh, R&R issues. Uh, and there is some talk that, you know, the Indian industry feels that the terms uh, which are being set out or set forth are prohibitive and, you know, makes the projects unviable. Now, of course, the Modi government wants to accelerate, you know, the implementation of projects. So what is your take uh, about what could be, you know, some developments with regards to the R&R uh, situation for such projects, sir? See, uh, the land acquisition bill and the R&R bill, which has come up uh, in the last government, was supported by BJP also. Uh, and my own appreciation of this bill is that it is not really that prohibitive as it is made out to be by some industry or business experts. Uh, if you really go by uh, the calculation that the raw land which is required to set up an industry is in India, the cost of that land is still not that high, that it doesn't form a major component of the entire capital investment that comes in in setting up an industry. For example, if it, there is a power plant which takes about 7 crores per megawatt investment, the overall land cost, even if it is about 25 lakhs or 30 lakh an acre, so it wouldn't uh, really be that much if you see the overall project cost. So I believe that the uh, the fears are not really um, not really tenable or they're not really that true. And if you go by the overall project cost, the land component still is very small. Because uh, I was hearing the discussion that you had with Mr. Subir Gokarn. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, he mentioned about that the organized retail uh, industry has not done that well in India because of the high prohibitive cost in the commercial uh, uh, commercial sector, commercial real estate. So here, here lies the actual explanation here. The raw land in India is very, very cheap. It is only after it gets converted into the commercial real estate that the land becomes very, very prohibitively expensive. So as far as the industry is concerned, they require law, raw land. And with these kind of bills in place, and I'm sure that it will also help in removing some regional disparities in the spread of industry that we have seen in the last so many years. So ultimately, I still feel that the land acquisition bill is a win-win situation for industry as well as uh, for the land owners. And... Mm, it, it shouldn't be that prohibitive because because of this bill, ultimately it will be easier for the industry to uh, acquire the land from the private partners or for or for, for the private parties or get them into the private stakeholders for the long term. 
So it is all about getting into this practice of uh, this in the spirit of the new act. So it's just about getting used to the spirit of the new act, and I believe that it shouldn't be a big issue once we start working on it. Very fairly said, sir. Very fairly said, sir. Um, um, we have a question coming in. In fact, we have several questions coming in, and as usual, we are trying to juggle and prioritize which ones to ask, and you know, in the sense to get the best value of uh, picking your brilliant minds and experiences uh, for our callers. This question is from Matt uh, at Capitol Hill in D.C. He wants to know what is the agenda of the Modi Obama summit, which is uh, supposed to come up sometime in September. Would you care to throw some light on that, sir? Uh, again, I would say this. Uh, uh -huh. I am a spokesperson of Bharatiya Janata Party, and I can't sure. really be speaking on behalf of the government. But yes, uh, mm -hmm. if you really want me to do uh, indulge in some sort of guesswork, uh, sure, please, sir. There are uh, there are there are certain very very important issues uh, on priority list with the United States uh, between India and United mm -hmm. States. So um, uh, we we could, we could be discussing about the trade uh, imbalance between India and the uh, U.S. and uh, the, the, there could be economic issues, there could be some international pol pol political issues. For example, uh, in the last few years, for almost more than 10 years, India and the United States have been uh, working together against the uh, terror networks operating in w different parts of the world and we have been working in close coordination there could be some issues linked to the needs of defense sector in india where we really need to upgrade our defense infrastructure and the us there, there are a lot of there are a lot of potential of uh, joint working between in India and United States in this sector, particularly after the uh, FDI is uh, permitted in the defense sector in India. So it could be a huge opportunity for United States companies to come and invest in India. Uh, there could also be, uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Modi could be picking up the issues related to the IT industry uh, in uh, particularly uh, working in India and the IT professionals working in US for uh, we've always been raising issues related to the uh, their visas of Indian professionals so um, besides that there could be many many more issues I can't really get into the details of those things at this moment I'm sorry uh -huh. no sure appreciate it sir uh, another question which is coming in uh, is actually pertaining to some recent news about, you know, women's security in India. The question is asking that what is the, uh, I mean, what is uh, the government or uh, the stance of the party, let's say, since you are saying you represent the party, of course, sir, that what, would the, what could we look forward to in the next 100 days or in the next couple of months which would improve the situation for women's security because it's really damaging the image of India, quote, unquote, and of course it affects, you know, the tourism and the economic aspects, but much more than that is the issue of, you know, uh, safety and security. So what are some steps you think which are being contemplated uh, on this aspect, sir? It's, it's a very, very important social issue. And uh, more than the image, I would rather be interested in actually uh, working on seriously to make the society aware about these issues. And ultimately, it is the society which needs to respond. But as far as the government is concerned, uh, we all know that law and order primarily is a state subject in India, and we have ha we have had few governments which have a very very poor track record with, in terms of women's safety, like we have uh, in Uttar Pradesh uh, or, or 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 also in Delhi. But at the same time, when you see states like Gujarat, the uh, safety related issues with respect to the women are uh, still mm -hmm. quite good over there but this, but at the same time not getting into the uh, differences in different states what the central government could be uh, thinking of doing at this point of time is to bring in much stronger uh, legislation uh, with respect to the women's safety and security issues and uh, mm -hmm. last year uh, there was uh, a bill with respect to uh, i guess uh, uh, on um, the, uh, the after we had that uh, serious rape 
incident in Delhi, then we had the, the penalty provisions related to rape were uh, made much more stringent and stronger. So something like mm -hmm. this, we, we, we as a society and we as a nation has to finally rise up to the uh, this disaster of uh, uh, women security issues that we are faced with today. And the government of the day it's, uh, must take it on priority and come up with some much stronger legislation on these issues. And besides this, what is more important mm -hmm. is to raise the level of awareness in the society to kind of guide the society towards um, that the society is much more conscious about the rights of women and uh, issues related to the women's security. So uh, the government has a role in even in creating awareness about it. And I sincerely hope and believe that the, things, uh, the time has come that we wake up as a nation and things improve in, con uh, in India uh, with respect to these issues. Very true, sir. Very true. Uh, uh, just a quick follow-up on this particular, as a footnote, maybe the question, uh, the chat has just popped up, and asking that, is there any scope, not scope, uh, uh, are we looking at some faster, speedy justice kind of scenarios? Or, I mean, of course, there's a fast-track mechanism often which we have in India, but some aspects of judicial reform which can, you know, speed up justice. I agree. I agree. You couldn't have given a better suggestion on this. And we have seen in uh, uh, some incidents in isolation wherein uh, a rape victim was given justice within about uh, 100 days. But uh, this is something which must become an order of the day. And it, it mm -hmm. must be part of the entire legislation itself that uh, some sort of fast track uh, judicial or grievance judicial mechanism must be put in place so that uh, it is deterrent on the part of the offenders. And uh, there is some sort of scare in the mindset of uh, the offenders in these issues. Great. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, another question which has come up uh, pertains actually to, again, uh, you know, domestic political aspect on the issue of gas pricing in India. Uh, apparently, the pricing of gas, as we understand, is going to be revised uh, up till 8 point something dollars per MMBTU. Now, would this uh, have any political uh, ramifications or implications? Um, the question is just asking because before the elections, there was a lot of debate and rhetoric around the issue of gas pricing in India. Uh, and as we now understand, the prices are going to be revised in the next 10, 15, 20 odd or so days. Uh, so the, is the revision going on and is there any political, uh, you know, ramification of this? See, what we have to understand it is that there is an administrative mm -hmm. issue and there is a policy mm -hmm. in place. We've already, mm -hmm. uh, so there, there is a committee which is to decide on the gas pricing. The committee had already decided about it. It's just that the cabinet had to approve of the, uh, the recommendations of that committee, and which, which has actually happened. And these gas prices can come up for review uh, um, by, by that committee uh, again and again as per the, uh, the policy. So I believe that, um, uh, these issues must be left to the administrative prudence in the interest of the nation, in the interest of investment in the climate in the country, and uh, in overall, definitely in the interest of the citizens of this country, in the interest of economy of this country. So uh, we, if we try to raise political rhetoric on uh, issues like this, then again we can get into a situation of uh, um, policy, uh, confusions which we must not mm -hmm. and uh, if at all if at all there is some sort of negative impact on the overall uh, gas prices to, for the consumers in uh, short term or long term of course the government must pitch in and government must uh, you know, take necessary steps so that the consumers are not affected by any sort of uh, increase in the gas prices and it also doesn't uh, result in a cascading impact on the in, uh, inflation as such. Great. Thank you, sir. Uh, a question coming in uh, for you, which is asking that, how can the diaspora in the United States, and actually this is uh, maybe not, this may be somebody from the UK we have, actually. Yeah. Anyway, so how can the diaspora contribute 
to change in India in the next 100 days? And a footnote question along with it, what could be the 100-day plan of the NRI ministry? But I think in a big picture, the, the caller is asking that how can the Indian diaspora in the United States and across the world contribute in any which way to the, you know, because there's a sense of change and fast change and expectation uh, all over, uh, one thing, uh, everywhere. Uh, which so is what the would most be your important thing, uh, with, uh, uh, which, is, which, could, which is the most important thing in my mind, is mm -hmm. that the confidence in the Indian, the sovereign that India is. And with Mr. Narendra really? Modi coming in as Prime Minister of India, the confidence mm -hmm. in the sovereign of India has improved uh, at international level. And uh, mm -hmm. if, we understand, if we understand the uh, mechanics, mechanics of the investment markets, be it capital markets or be it foreign currency markets, they have responded positively. So I can say that the investor community has responded positively about the possibilities of the economy in future. And the Indian diaspora had been a mainstay and one of one of our core strengths as far as investments back into India is concerned. So with this kind of in confidence, investors' confidence coming back into the affairs of the state of this country, so uh, mm -hmm. the diaspora can actually lead and take initiative in bringing an investment in India with Mr. Modi at the helm of affairs and with the promise of BJP with respect to the uh, proactive policy initiatives and uh, the consistency of policy like uh, on taxation and so many other issues related to the invest in investment climate. So within 100 days, if I have to say one thing, that what the Indian diaspora can contribute uh, in, in, in the story of India is that they can lead the initiative. They can uh, mm -hmm. be that in initial igniting spark with, as far as the investment uh, uh, in investments in India is concerned. Mm -hmm. Then the rest of the world can follow. So um, they can judge, they can gauge for themselves that this is probably the best time to come and invest in India in, after so many years. Thank you so much, Captain. And of course, we have our other eminent speaker expert, Dr. Subir Gokan, also with whom, of course, we need to follow up on a bunch of questions which have been coming in while I've been speaking with you. But in the meanwhile, maybe I would invite my colleague and our chairman, uh, Sanjay Puri, for some questions uh, with the, the Captain Abhimanyu. Sanjay, if you are there, please. I think you are there definitely, right? Sanjay? To you, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, Captain, it's such a pleasure. Our uh, listeners uh, around the world have been uh, pounding us with questions uh, that have come in. Our listeners are on from Capitol Hill. They're members of Congress, Senate, uh, think tank people, etc. Uh, and so I'm going to ask a couple of questions on their behalf that have been coming in. One of the questions that has come in was really um, from uh, Capitol Hill that, uh, you know, Mr. Modi has come in with a huge mandate, um, and obviously there's huge minorities in India. What, in the 100-day uh, period that he has, are there any confidence-building measures that he can do uh, to assure the minorities that this is going to be a government? And he's said that many, many times, I understand, but this is the question that comes in. Are there any symbolic things that he can do to and that make everybody feel that this is a government for everybody, in all the minorities in there. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, BJP as a party, and Mr. Modi as the leader of the party, has always maintained that we do not believe in the politics of symbolism. And this is exactly what, unfortunately, the minorities had had to suffer over a long period of time, that they were only uh, offered tokenism and symbolism instead of some real, real beneficial things for them. And uh, the such a committee report to conclude that the minorities have actually uh, suffered uh, since independence and their overall social, economic, and cultural indicators uh, tell a story that the situation has gone from bad to worse. So as far as if you ask me that, first 100 days, uh, some confidence-building measures, uh, what Mr. Narendra Modi's government can do. I can only say one thing, that it's purely focusing on good governance and development for all and appeasement of none. Sabka saath, sabka vikas is getting everyone together, and everyone gets the benefit of that without uh, 
focusing especially on either of these segments of society or sections of society. And finally, this is something everyone will come to believe that this government, Mr. Modi's government, is actually uh, thinking of all Indians as one, not as majority or minorities or this class or that class or this class or that class or urban or uh, rural or poor and rich or industry, industrialists or labor. So ultimately, within first 10 days, I'm sure we'll be able to dispel the fears in the mind of anyone that Whatever, whatever fears they had in their mind, by the very fact that we are going to focus on good government and development for all. That's uh, excellent, uh, Captain Abhimanyu. That will be a message that we will convey back to Capitol Hill to some senators who raised this issue. I want to turn to investment and trade. You brought it up. We are uh, uh, going to be bringing a large delegation of some of the top uh, private equity investors and. Some questions have come in, and hopefully Mr. Gokhan has uh, uh, explained some of them, but maybe you can address some of this. Their issues are simple. It's the retroactive taxation. It's GST. It is creating a good, transparent environment, just like any other investor wants, that India is going to be consistent in its policies, uh, clear governance. Can you address this? Because next month when we bring them in, and we are saying that India is now open for business. Mr. J.P. has said red, uh, red carpet, not red tape. We want you to just elaborate for these investors uh, what sectors, you know, they've talked about FDI for defense. Are they looking at potentially insurance and financial services? Uh, because these are the questions that are coming in from some of the largest uh, private equity players for us, uh, Captain. Uh, yeah, uh, we... Do understand that uh, to create a congenial investment climate, we have to make sure that the investors who come in have a fair amount of confidence in the overall policy framework and fair amount of confidence in the stability of the policy and consistency of the policy. And the policy is futuristic instead of retrospective. And also, the most important fact is that they have to have a confidence that their, in, their investments will yield reasonable returns for them. So this is a point which, as a state, we have to concede that they get returns on their investment, fair amount of returns, or the, or, and fair and reasonable returns on their, in, on their investment, because that will only ensure the continuity or the continuous flow of investments into India. So once we have this very clear in our mind, Ms., uh, Mr. Arun Jetley has also spelled out that there will be no red tape, there will be only red carpet, Yes, we are. We we are a bit focused on where we where like investments should take place, and particularly in FDI investment, primarily in the uh, infrastructure sector. And I believe that there is a huge, huge opportunity for uh, international investors to come and invest in into Indian infrastructure growth story, which is uh, yet to begin and which is about to begin. And this is something which we are going to focus. Tremendously, let it be power sector or the roads or the rail network or uh, some basic core industries which will actually be required for example, steel or fertilizers if you really want to give a push to the um, infrastructure sector and also the agriculture sector. So I believe that there could be many, many big ticket investments coming into India with this kind of approach. And this is something uh, we are seeing for the long run, that India become a favorite hot destination for the global investors, and and it remains so for long. It, and they join in the India growth story, India development story, and we all reap the benefits of it together. We are prepared to share the benefits, and we, uh, we are responsible. Uh, to ensure that uh, their investments give a uh, reasonable amount of returns to them. So uh, I think it's the time are, it's the time for making investments in India. The time of India has come. And that's the message we are saying, that India is open for business. That's the theme that we are saying, that India is now open for business. Uh, Captain Abhimanyu, one last question, and I come back to a question that gets asked to us at 
every social gathering, every event and others, I'm talking about the diaspora and keeps coming to us. And you uh, very rightly said it's more than a brand issue or image issue, it's a social issue. You said it's a state issue. But let's take this from a educational and awareness issue about this woman's safety issue. Can't something be done through the Ministry of HRD in terms of creating awareness, the, the value and equality of women? India is a culture where so many goddesses you have are women, and still we see some of these things happen because we, when people look at Indian Americans in this country or around the diaspora, they always ask us, what is going on? And it puts us really, when I say us, I'm, talk, I'm speaking now on behalf of the 29 million uh, diaspora outside. It makes us defensive. That's not to say that other societies don't have this issue. This is not an Indian society. But I'm saying is we all, as uh, people of Indian origin, want to see something happen. But from an HRD ministry perspective, is there something that can be done to run some kind of awareness campaigns in India towards this campaign? Uh, of course, I agree with you that uh, this particular issue needs to be dealt with uh, a much more holistic approach. And, and it has to be taken from all around. We have to go ag against it. We have to go on it from all sides. And as I said in my initial statement, that um, the overall awareness and consciousness about the women-related issues has to be in, has to improve. And Mr. Hachardi, of course, you know, finally, as I said, that we have to now steer the society to a more, more civilized world. And uh, Mr. Hachardi or, uh, can definitely bring in something in curriculum or extracurricular activities in the school, at the school level or even at higher levels to uh, bring in this kind of uh, consciousness. And it, it cannot be done in a day. It is something which has to be planned for long term. At least a generation has to be trained so that it, gen it, it trains the future generations about these issues. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a long drawn thing. But at the same time, as I said, that we have to adopt a multi-pronged holistic approach towards this issue. But yes, that it's high time we as a society, we as a nation, rise to this disaster and we must respond to it with all the might at, that's uh, all the might that is there thank you captain very well said i will turn it over now to robinder to continue this discussion robinder thank you sanjay thank you so Thank you, Sanjay, and uh, thank you so much, Captain Abhimanyu, and uh, welcome back, Dr. Gokarn. Uh, I, I hope and thank I believe that we have you with us still, sir. Thank you yes, so I'm, much. I'm still now, uh, great, sir. Coming back to some questions on economics, because we deviated towards more the political affairs, perhaps, in the last few minutes. Uh, I'm picking up uh, on some of the thoughts that we had put earlier, on which we've gotten questions on chat coming in, and one of them was pertaining to GST. And as you said that, you know, uh, during this budget session, uh, even if, you know, there cannot be a, let's say, a, a finale to it, but there could be some commitment to the GST reform which is supposed to come up. The question was asking, right. supposing such, you know, indication of a commitment is not visible for whatever political reasons, how would the investor sentiment be affected? I think uh, overall it will put uh, pressure on the government to find uh, different ways to close the deficit. Again, I think we, we, you know, we have to constantly keep the primary objective in mind when we discuss policy issues. What is the objective mm -hmm. of GST is not an end in itself. It is a way to raise the tax to GDP ratio, that is the revenue realization by government from economic activity without uh, disrupting economic activity. I mean, we, we saw what disruption could do. The example of the retrospective uh, uh, tax, which was, which was, which turned out to be very disruptive. Uh, and we don't want, you know, we want to raise more taxes, but we don't want to deter economic activity because we're raising taxes. That's what the GST is supposed to do. So if you don't do that, then in order to achieve the objective of fiscal consolidation, which is to reduce the deficit, uh, you're going to look for other ways, and other ways are more and more difficult. So I think it's very important to read into an inability to uh, to, uh, to send any you know explicit signal or clear signal or GST that there will be greater mm -hmm. pressure on other things 
on other taxes, on cutting expenditures, uh, all kinds of other things which people will be equally upset about or maybe even more upset about. So uh, the way to position it uh, for the government is to say, look, you know, mm -hmm. this is, uh, there are difficulties, there are complexities, the different states are going to be affected differently. We have a, we should put in place a compensation mechanism. There's no question that it will not go through without comp a compensation framework. But that's, that's I think, uh, not a very difficult uh, uh, framework to design. But if you don't do this, mm -hmm. then there are lots of other things. Other, we'll have to pay a price somewhere else. Uh, and if that signal is not sent, then I think we have to be a little uh, worried about the ability of the government to get uh, control of the fiscal situation. And linking up to my second point, which is we need more money uh, uh, to be spent by government on infrastructure. If the GST doesn't happen, that objective is going to be compromised. And I think that's, again, something that the government has to be very strongly putting forward, that, you know, there are costs to this. There are, there are consequences to this. We cannot afford to have those consequences to, to uh, uh, have those consequences materialize. Uh, so I would be a little disappointed, I think, from a professional economist perspective mm -hmm. if a, a, a strong signal on GST did not come in this budget. And even if, as I said, I don't expect it to be clinched because of the whole legislative process that it, uh, has been gone through, but a time frame, a compensation formula, uh, commitment, I think, is very important to signal now. And I don't think can wait till March, till next, uh, uh, the next full, full year budget. Great. Thank you, sir. And, of course, you know, we are running into a pressure of time, but I think there are two, two quick questions we would like to, you know, uh, have your views on. One was, uh, okay. you all mentioned uh, d during your, your earlier uh, part of the talk, wherein you said that there could be, you know, like a, a selling of some assets, I mean, essentially some public sector, yeah. you know, disinvestment or divestment. Do you see any such yeah. happening in the next 100 days? And if, it's hap if it could happen, yeah. who could yeah. be the one or two PSU candidates for this? Well, there's already news about uh, Hindustan Zinc, I believe, which, uh, you know, a note has been, a cabinet note has been floated. I saw a rep news report today. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. these are, these, there is a pipeline of companies in which uh, the, the government had decided in principle to, to divest. So I don't really, you know, recall names of the top of my head, but uh, there is a pipeline of such companies. I think it's very relatively easy to just bring them into uh, play, particularly when market valuations as of now are extremely positive. So the government will actually realize a very substantial premium on uh, the stock mm -hmm. that they divest. That's one part. Uh, the second is uh, there is something called uh, SUTI, the Special Undertaking Un Unit Trust of India, which is a huge portfolio of uh, blue chip assets, which, you know, people may not remember the history of the unit trust, but it was uh, the first country's first mutual fund scheme, and you know people invested in it in units, and then they went and invested in companies. But there was a, there was a crisis, and the crisis resulted in restructuring. Uh, those good assets, the the blue chip assets, have been parked in a in a separate fund, and those need to come into the market because those are companies which the government really has no particular motivation or business owning. Uh, big big companies, very very prominent companies. Uh, may not be a very large amount in the overall scheme of things, but again, it's a signal that, hey, look, we're not going to be sitting on assets which we have no business to be sitting on. Let's get them into the market as soon as we can. Uh, that's, an, I think, a relatively easy objective or, uh, to achieve over the next uh, few months. And then a slightly longer term, you know, issues that we've been grappling with for the last several years, uh, mineral rights, spectrum, Land, as mm -hmm. I said, the government has a land, uh, you know, uh, a bank which they should be thinking of uh, monetizing. Uh, all of these should be pushed into a pipeline and with a very clear dedication of the re uh, the, the the realizations. So they, if you're selling land, then we're not going to use the money to pay, you know, government bureaucratic salaries. Uh, we're going to use it to create new infrastructure or new schools or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but there's a clear link mm -hmm. between the sale of assets and the creation of new assets. I think that linkage to me is politically very important because otherwise people see it and it's very easy to spin it as, you know, selling the family silver. Uh, you, you sell uh, assets in order to consume more, and that's really not a good sign, good uh, message for the government to be sending. So I like the idea of, uh, of asset for asset, or what I call a balance, balance sheet swap. If you sell assets, then you must use that money to create new socially purposeful, socially meaningful assets. 
Very true, sir. I think you are you're talking uh, perhaps as we are sensing a very interesting portfolio approach. You know, both in your uh, right. uh, uh, right. earlier discussion just before this and now that you know, even in the case of GST, if you don't do GST, then there are other items in the portfolio which get affected. So you got to you know yeah. balance out and on this sale of this uh, public assets also. Great. So just one last quick question, more from a foreign affairs or uh, India's international affairs perspective. How important do you think is a seat on the UN Security Council for this Modi government? And do you think they they will proactively push it early on in their tenure, or will they kind of not invest the political capital soon and just kind of keep it as one of the issues, but not really go? you know, with uh, in an aggressive mode towards that. What is your thought on that? I, I think, uh, you know, we have to be focused on getting the economy uh, on a track to become globally powerful, globally influential. Uh, I think this, a, a permanent seat on the Security Council may in, end up as a consequence of that performance. But uh, mm -hmm. to, to look for it as an objective in and of itself, uh, without fixing the, the the fundamental problems that we've talked about right through this conversation, you know, getting the right, uh, getting more jobs, getting people into jobs, raising economic growth, getting people's quality of life uh, up to you know to desirable standards. All of those are fundamental objectives. Let's focus on that. You know, the, the Security Council is 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 certainly a prize, but it's a prize that has to be, I think. Uh, Earn, not you know you can't object you can't sort of treat that as a, a separate and distinct objective from the, the what what underpins it. Great, I, I, thank I you so much, Doctor. That, that is my my view on what the approach should be. Uh, I think that's really what the approach will be also. Sure, fair enough. Very very much appreciated. Thank you so much, Dr. Gokun. You know, there are, in fact, you know, I think several questions still pending from the chat of today and from the uh, from earlier in the week which have come uh, come to us. But unfortunately, we've totally run out of time. In fact, kind of gone over a few minutes also, I think. And we thank you so much for your time, for, for being with us and taking our questions all across the spectrum. We thank also all our callers who've called in, and we thank also our team of U.S. India Political Action Committee, Sanjay Fuji, the chairman, uh, Dr. Surbhi Garg, the co-founder and VP of operations, Vikram Chauhan, a co-founder also, uh, and our several other volunteers and associates who are with us. Please do keep your questions coming in for the next week. And with that, I hand it, uh, I hand it over to my colleague, John, for saying the vote of thanks. John, over to you, please, sir. Thank you, Ravinder. Thank you uh, to all of our panelists, especially to our attendees who take time out of their busy weekends for U.S. Impact. Please watch U.S. Impact social media portals for more information, timely updates, and other ways you can help U.S. India Political Action Committee stay financially strong during this important time in history. On behalf of U.S. Impact's Chairman Sanjay Puri, co-founders Ravinder Sachdev, Dr. Surabhi Garg, Vic Chauhan, and strategic, strategic advisors Rhea Banerjee and Sue Ghosh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's call. We'll see you next weekend at 11 a.m. Eastern. Bye-bye.